This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. I'm calling the Finance Committee meeting of March 30, 2021 to order at um, four minutes after two and want to welcome everybody. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's uh, March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted via remote participation. And um, I need to go to members of the committee and make sure that um, they can acknowledge that they can um, hear and be heard, which will serve as a method of also introducing to everybody, members of the committee, then I wanted to um, go around to the other people who are present and uh, ask for them to introduce themselves also. And the other thing that I would like to know from um, all of our guests who are here, and I very much appreciate everybody being here, is whether you have any special time constraints uh, for your participation, because I wanna note that and then make sure that we get the final order of the um, meeting um, to, to accommodate um, kind of those special requests. Um, and then I'll comment on what I had thought about um, is the order of the meeting um, is the next step. So, but the first thing is to go around and make sure that everybody can um, hear me and be heard for starting with, for the committee members. So, uh, Pat D'Angelis? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. And Lynn Griesmer? Present. And, um, See Bob Hegner. Yes. <clears throat> and um, Bernie Kubiak. Present. And uh, see if we're looking to see if uh, Jane Scheffler is. Yeah, she's here. Uh, her picture's here, Andy. I'm okay. here. Hi, Jane. Hello. Okay, so I, have I missed any uh, members of the committee? I don't think so. So um, let's get, um, uh, you now know who the members of the committee are. Um, five of us are counselors and three are, member, are members of the committee who are resident members of the, um, which is provided in our town charter. Um, so uh, I don't know, Sharon, um, do you want to go and introduce the people who are here from the trustees and from the library and then ask them the question as to whether they have any special uh, considerations on time that we need to be aware of? Or... Sure, yes. Uh, let me okay. okay. Let me look around my screen. Bob, Pam, hello. Do you have any time constraints? I to get to bed by midnight. <laughs> Very, very well. Bob is our treasurer. And as I keep going along, Alex the Fave, she is our clerk. Alex, do you have any time constraints? I do not. Thank you. Um, I see Kent Ferber, who is the chair of our capital campaign committee. Kent, do you have any time constraints? No, he's good to go. And as I keep going, Ken Gayette, um, I'm assuming you want me to do more than just trustees, Andy. Um, so Ken Gayette is our OPM. Ken, do you have any time constraints? I do not. Thank you very much. And I see George Barnes, who is uh, the other half of our, our OPM team. George, do you have any time constraints? I do not. Thank you very much. I think that's everybody, Andy. Okay, thank Oh, no, you. wait. Wait, one more. I'm sorry, Jim. Jim Alexander. Uh, he's from Feingold Alexander. He's our, our architect. Jim, do you have any time constraints? No, I'm fine. And thank Doug's you. here as well. And thank Doug. you. Yeah, thank you. So I think that... And, and Doug Connor is here also, I think. 
Sharon, it's, it's Doug Kelleher with Epsilon. Um, and if I could be released by 3.30, that would be great. Uh, who, this is Jim. Doug, Doug Kelleher, Epsilon. Uh, Doug Kelleher. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so, um, and I understand that there are a couple of people who will be joining later. And um, so what we, what I thought about um, and uh, I need to shuffle, we need to shuffle this again, um, possibly because of uh, what Doug just said. But I thought we should start by talking about issues, including fundraising historic tax credits, um, the Endowment Community Preservation Act, um, and uh, um, budget questions um, and anything having to in uh, the MOU and then later get into the building and um, but I think that if we're going to have we may have to do a little bit of the building questions earlier if um, Mr. Keller can't uh, remain with us so uh let me just get rid of this. Um, so uh, does anybody have any comments? Lynn, do you have any further comments on the order that we had discussed earlier? Um, no, except that we've already had quite a discussion about the a design and, we, and the benefit of having um, Jim with us last time, two weeks ago. And the same is true for Collier's, both Ken and uh, George uh, from two weeks ago. So I think I would suggest we start with the historic tax credits. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to uh, try and go through questions. I really wanna to turn to the committee um, to see what questions come um, there are about various topics as we go through and uh, we all have seen the document. I really appreciate the amount of effort that has gone in from everybody's part on putting um, together the uh, information that has been requested. And um, this has been circulated not just to the Finance Committee, but to all members of the Council um, as a document. And we will uh, make an effort if there's additional information to be added at the conclusion of this meeting uh, to make sure that it gets added and circulated. But um, I th I'm really um, now feeling that we have created a process and gone through a process that I know has been a lot of work, but really is going to inform the discussion that's going to take place next Monday when uh, we anticipate getting to a decision. So um, if we wanna uh, start with that, uh, um, there have been substantial information on historic tax credits provided in previous meetings and uh, in written documents, but I wanna open it up uh, to see if there are additional questions on historic tax credits. And Dorothy, I see your hand up. Is that what it's about, or do you have another yeah, no, issue? It, it is. I want to say that I really followed the discussion. Um, it's true, I get confused as to what meeting that I heard what, but there was a very detailed discussion. I entered the meeting very skeptical of historic tax credits, and it was explained in great detail and very thoroughly so that I'm satisfied. I The one part that is um, like loose is that you never quite know how much is gonna be accepted at any one time, but that you just keep going on and bit by bit by bit, you should in fact get the amount that you have budgeted in. Um, so I don't have any more questions about that, uh, which I think is unusual. So that's it. Hey, Kathy. Um, well, as Joyce said, we've had these explained pretty well. Um, my, I think my question, and I saw a partial answer, um, as I understand it, once you apply, you often apply more than once to get the total amount. And I wanted a sense if the building, number one, I think I heard that the building has to be completed, you know, and that's when you 
your, it triggers it. So what is the typical time lag? Is it when you're successful? Is it two years later, three years later? So in that repeated, and I saw how many times a year you can apply. So just you've had an experience on a, usually by the second year or by the third year or what, that's all I'm looking for. What is the lag? And you've given the range of estimates and you've pegged it in the middle. You know, as I understand on, could be as high as this, could be as low as this, and you've given us a middle. So the time lag. So the time lag as far as from the completion of the project to when the credits become available for use? For uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So it's, I know when we think the project is gonna end and we get the last payment, you know, I right. know when that is. So I, whatever that date is, and then um, you're working to apply and to reapply. So it's when you have the money in your hand. Right, so we'll be applying throughout construction. Um, and then basically at the completion of the project, once the, once the project is completed um, and essentially a certificate of occupancy is issued, we then submit the part three application. And then from the time the part three application is, is submitted to the time you get the certificate, um, which is basically the, the item that is then sold um, that is typically you know anywhere from 30 to 60 days from submitting the part three application so a relatively quick turnaround so you get the certificate so that triggers the second question then uh, someone out there has to be willing to buy it so Correct. you're then you're making you're doing the deal making and what what kind of lag has been that experience so typically that, <clears throat> that whole process plays out while you're applying for credits. In other words, you identify your investor, the, the investor comes forward with an offer of, you know, whatever the amount is, you know, per credit, whether it be, you know, 80 cents on the dollar, 85 cents on the dollar, 90 cents on the dollar. But that agreement is worked out and put into place prior to submittal of the part three application. So once you have your certificate, you can then close on the sale of the credits essentially immediately. Okay, thank you. That's that answers completely answers my question. Great. So there are other questions from other members of the committee. I think what I'm trying to just make sure as we piece this together and get into our final discussion about the MOU is that since it is an important part of the fundraising package, that we make sure that we have the timing sequence as you've described it coinciding with what our goals are um, as we established in the memorandum of understanding that we're thinking about having between the town and the library. Um, That was why I was asking Andy. Yeah, you know, on, yeah on I know. Yeah. I don't believe that the uh, consultants have necessarily seen the MOU. Um, and so I'm not sure they can answer it in relationship to that. I think the way that Kathy asked the question uh, and is to find out we hear, what we're hearing is that you keep applying for credits as the project goes through different stages. And then once you have your certificate of occupancy is when you actually then move to what we just heard was this third um, application. And that's what actually triggers the certificate, which can then lead to the sale. So it sounds to me like you, you're building up throughout the process of building. But once you have your certificate of occupancy, then you can actually move to the sale of the credits. I'm more than willing to be corrected on that. It sounded like up to two months, so the 30 to 60 days. Um, yeah. Right, Doug? Correct, so, yes. So Lynn, your, your understanding is absolutely correct. Right. So, I didn't assume. Go ahead. I was not assuming, Lynn, that anybody else, that everybody on the call seen the memorandum of understanding but i was just trying to make sure since we have both representatives of the library and trustees present as well as representatives of the town that um, 
we leave this conversation with the comfort level that it all fits together with between what we have drafted and um, the trustees acted on this morning and um, where we're, we're going. And I think the answer is yes. Alex has a yeah, Alex. Comes, Bob. So I mean, if, if you're looking to hear yes, I mean, the, the MOU is the last payment of the MBLC is one year after the certificate of occupancy. So in theory, we should be getting the historic tax credits within the first couple of months. So there's still that cushion of one year um, if for some reason it goes longer than 30 to 60 days. So from my perspective, I, it, it all dovetails nicely. Okay, so um, thank you, Alex. Uh, other questions from anyone present regarding subject of the historic tax credits? Bob Hegner has. Uh, Bob question. Hegner. Yeah, my my qu my question is just is uh, I understand that the the one point six million dollars is an estimate, and there's a range associated with that estimate, and. I'm not clear, wasn't clear to me what happens if the actual is below the 1.6 million and what happens if the actual is above the 1.6 million? Where does the money come from in the first place and where does the money go to in the second place? Um, Andy, you want me to try? Yeah. You want to try it or Kent? Uh... Yes, maybe I should try to answer that. The $6.6 .6 million commitment of the trustees is composed of a number of parts, all of which are essentially estimates, but they were composed in amounts that uh, are sufficiently flexible that if one part falls short, the other parts can make it up. And uh, so that the commitment of the trustees is the 6.6 .6 million. Does that answer your question? And, and if the historic tax credits come to more than the 6.6 .6 million, then we have to raise less in the other parts. Although, um, you know, I, I can't speak for the trustees, but if the money is raised in the capital campaign for the construction of the building, that's where the money should go. Um, and I, I can, uh, <clears throat> can't, I can speak to that experience from the campaign that I ran. And that is that there was a remainder of about 200,000 and it was put into a uh, investment fund. And that investment fund can be tapped when something needs to be done that was part of what would be considered the construction of the building. And so, for example, a roof repair, or we had to repair a shower in this case. So it usually when those funds are given for a purpose, they have to be reserved and designated and then spent for that purpose. Okay, that's the important point is that the trustees have made the commitment for a total of 6.6 .6 million. And where exactly that comes from is at this point can only be estimated and estimated based upon plausible um, estimates. And the best estimate for a historic tax credit is the 1.6. If it's short, we have enough um, possibilities uh, to cover whatever shortage there is. And did you have something else since you can still? Yeah, I actually have a question for Doug, and that is, are the applications along the way plugged to milestones in construction, to uh, applications for payment from MBLC? Um, how you said there you apply as you're going along. So I'm kind of a little curious about what that means. Right, so many, <clears throat> excuse me, many projects um, apply for credits even before they get started. In other words, while they're still going through the final design and permitting of the project, 
And then once a project goes into construction, then you continue to apply. And basically, you know, you can apply, there's no set milestones for the applications. You know, you just follow the state's application deadlines. Um, and if you have a project that, um, depending on how you look at it, fortunately or unfortunately, has a long construction period, then that allows you greater application rounds in which you can apply. But basically once the project is completed and the building is placed into service, then you're no longer eligible to, to apply. Thank you. So let me just um, open it up for any additional questions from um, committee or others about uh, fundraising, the whole fundraising package. Or do we feel questions have been adequately answered? Had substantial discussion on it. Pat, your hand yeah, is up. Uh, Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm moving to the uh, million dollars in CPA money, um, which is part of the fundraising package. And I've gotten asked this question uh, by resident after resident. Um, and I, when I was reading, it says um, the, uh, the CPA money was not incorporated into the repair options as it has not been determined if they are eligible. So my question, and wouldn't knowing eligibility of the funds affect where we place that money in a re renovation? Um, so I, I'm not sure why the trustees haven't determined eligibility um, and then apply, if, if the funds are eligible, apply that to what mm -hmm. residents can see about the renovation as opposed to the, re, you know, the whole schmuggy. And I also, I, the other part of that question from residents is that's taxpayer money. How can you say that it's fundraising? Why doesn't it affect the town share of the project? And I don't have adequate answers for those questions. Ken, your hand is up to you. Yes. So um, the de a determination of what kind of CPA funds might be available for the repair option is really not possible without having a detailed, much more detailed sense of what would be done in the repair option. Uh, we know, for example, that nothing under at least that I know of, of the repair option possibilities improves the space for special collections. So the whole purpose of the grant that we've already been recommended disappears. Um, what else might represent uh, historic preservation of a 1928 building or even improvements for special collections remains to be seen. But in addition, and this is something I think really needs to get out on the table is that anybody who's worked in the foundation knows that qualification doesn't necessarily mean grants. Free money is wanted by everybody. You get five pieces of mail in your mailbox every day. So if something qualifies, that doesn't mean that it effectively competes for scarce funds. There's always more applications than there's money to give. And this was true for the CPA process this year and all the prior years and would be true for the CPA process if a application was made for some of the repair work. So that makes it all the more harder to determine what might in fact end up being granted uh, in the way of CPA funds for a repair option. It's, you, you want me to, you wanna, does that answer at least part of your first question? Yes, part of it, yes, go ahead. Well, and then as to the quote counting of the CPA funds, um, that's a, uh, that, well, that starts from the premise that it's all town funds. And in fact, that's not true. Some of the CPA money is a state match. It's state funds. And the state has attached conditions to those, uh, among which are that it can't be used to replace operating funds. And <clears throat> if the purpose of using the money to pay down the Pound bond funds 
is to reduce the operating funds necessary to do that, that begins to look like a replacement. And money is not, as you know, completely fungible. This CPA money is restricted to certain purposes. And uh, it, it, I, I, it, it, there's a question in my mind, strong question in my mind about whether when you establish a fund to encourage people to engage in some sort of activity and then they do it, you take it away from them at, you know, only for good reason. And so the fact that the, the library is doing a project that has historic preservation and other town objectives, so it gets money from two sources, it doesn't justify taking it away from one in order to pay for the other. Finally, uh, the $6.6 .6 million goal was established after really careful consideration. It was the maximum that the trustees and the friends thought um, plausible, reasonable. And so if you raise that to 7.6 million, which is what happens to the math, if you take away the million and the town's shares reduce to 14.8 million, uh, if you're concerned about jeopardizing the endowment with this commitment, that should really concern you. My own view is that 7.6 million is, is a real stretch. And I'm not sure the friends um, would be willing to undertake. Thank you. Kathy, did Son you respond? Sonia, uh, you had your hand up and then took it down. I didn't know uh, you're back. Do you have something to add to the response before I go to the well, two I, counselors? Well, I can clarify CPA funding, um, I think. I hope I can do that well enough for everyone to understand. CPA funding is, is going to stand alone. There's a special account that's created for this for the special collections room, we do not write a check and hand it over to the library for the fundraising or anything. It has to be connected to the special collections room. And um, when you see the council order that goes out, you will see that the total cost of the construction project will be less than $1 million from CPA because that's a separate council order. So that money is kept separate. It is tax. It is tax funding. It is a surcharge on people's property. So you, you can add it to your fundraising in theory, or you can, if you want it to be tax funding, you can take your choice. But it does stand alone. Gotcha. Yeah. Was that clear? I hope. No, that was very clear. I'm holding my tongue. Huh. Oh, about something. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia, as always. Uh, Kathy and then Bernie. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build on Pat's question and also have a quick response to what Kent said. I was um, there when the special collections was proposed and uh, a great deal of focus was on the heating, cooling, humidifying systems. I believe the repair option includes redoing heating, cooling, humidifying systems. So there are parts of the old building, just as in earlier years, Jones has applied to repair the roof, has repaired for various pieces. So the CPA fund, to me, legitimately has been a go-to fund for this incredibly historic building. Um, so I think uh, you could look at the repair option, the part of it that was in the historic building and, and say, it's hard to believe there wouldn't be a significant amount, whether it's a million, I don't know, that would qualify. Of course, you would have to apply for it. But um, I watched the reaction to the CPA committee. People love the Jones. And if it's to keep it functioning and conserve it, they will spend it. So that was just a response to that. And then a question I have actually of Sonia, um, if it's earmarked for the special collection, do you get specific bills coming in for special collection for the heating and, you know, because they, they had to provide an estimate of the special collection piece because um, 
now that it's in the historic building, this may be a mute point, but are you going to get earmarked invoices that this is special collection? So I just had a question of how this works. That's what we would expect, yes. Okay. Bernie? Just want to reinforce the point that uh, Kent made that using having been through this in <clears throat> a couple of different communities, uh, using CPA money for, um, for for restoration and repair is problematic when you're talking about renovations. Um, you know, again, having talked with in the previous finance committee meetings, the earlier finance committee, having talked with the library about the kind of work that needs to be done, um, I'm really doubtful that that any significant amount of that would qualify for uh, for CPA money. And I, I know the Jones is loved and I know that people are willing to help, but uh, I, I think Kent's right on target with his concerns about using that, uh, how those funds could be used. Yeah, which was generally, I think what, what my analysis had been too. And uh, if we got to the point where we are looking at the repair option and not looking at the renovation and addition option, there could be another application that would be made to CPA. I would expect that there would be another application that would be made to the Community Preservation Act Committee. Um, what might be determined to be eligible uh, under any of the criteria that apply which is uh, in this case uh, historic preservation would really depend upon how that repair option could get structured and how much of it could be qualified and you know, what the CPA committee would then in the end recommend to the council. Uh, those are speculative steps that would then come to play. Um, but there was uh, no basis, um, given the fact that the uh, trustees were applying for a CPA grant based upon um, a building plan that we're now discussing, uh, that it had to be, a, you know, it had to be an application that was uh, consistent with the building plan and. Uh, that the CPA committee uh, thought appropriate. And I think that's the way that they proceeded. Dorothy? I just want to say that um, I had a lot of questions and problems with that um, CPA money being used as part of the fundraising. But I have decided not to follow that through since the library made the statement. And I also just read it again in writing um, that if there is um, need for further funds, that the fundraising committee will find those funds. Um, that flexibility on the part of the library and the trustees, I think in a way makes up for the fact that the CPA money in some people's minds could have gone in one place or another. And that understanding is the understanding that makes me more confident about the plan, that the, the commitment of the trustees to um, find the extra money if it is needed and not to come to the town for it. Okay. Anything else, uh, Sonia? Yes, I'm speaking for on behalf of Sarah Marshall right now. She just emailed me and wanted me to remind everybody that this million dollars was explicitly contingent on the expansion going through. So if the expansion doesn't get voted through, this million dollars would be rescinded and you would have to go back to CPA for, for any other portion of that project. Yeah, I had, I had thought, I had hoped I had made that clear, but okay. there would have to be a new application, but thank you for the reinforcing that. And I think the last issue that uh, Ken touched on and just make sure um, that all members of the committee, finance committee understand it is that there are rules um, that the term that's used most frequently is supplanting. That if there's a town obligation 
already at hand, and uh, then you cannot use CPA money for something that has already been a, a committed town obligation. Um, and that's what the supplanting clause is about. And, uh, you know, we have talked about that some in how this is structured. Kathy, and then we should go on and see what else there is. Yeah, we can go on, Andy, but I think in the case where a nonprofit not owned by the town is applying to us for construction costs, we didn't have an obligation. We don't have it yet. We haven't agreed to it. So this is not the same as we're operating a building and we're shifting costs over. Both of these are, right now they're tied at the hip. Um, if the construction project goes forward, we owe, we're saying, and that's the whole MOU, we're committing to, but up until this point, um, we never, we the town never had the obligation for this building. This is also in a way an application to us as counselors. So I think it's just different than um, saying one building that we were gonna do for operating costs, we're moving some of that over to the CPA. That is, that's just a different situation. And I know we, we have a fine line on what those two are. So I'm not gonna debate it much because I think we're, we're in a position of being asked to both vote on the big chunk of money that would be town money and the big chunk of money that would be taxpayer money through CPA. And we should be calling it taxpayer money. So I'm not going to take it further unless uh, other comments are from, uh, to be made now. So are there other questions regarding the whole fundraising package part of it that um, committee mem any committee members feel need to still be addressed? Yeah, uh, Kathy, are you trying to raise your hand or? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to do it the official way with a little hand up. So I did it. But <laughs> I, mean, I saw I just, your hand waving, so I just wasn't sure. Yeah, so I just have, I, I think it's just making sure I'm reading it right. In the one chart, it says pledges of a little over a million, but in another place, we've been told some of that original in bequest you got, the 273 has been spent. So I think you have, something like 900,000 if I subtract that amount um, on hand right now to contribute, you know, with pledges. So I just wanted to make sure I was reading those right because, I, you know, I understood that you did the sustainability studies. So we got something for it. You know, we did some additional design. So I'm not saying someone lost the money. <laughs> it's just that the outstanding money that's still there um, of pledges to date. Am I correct in that, my math? Okay. You're uh, muted, so we can't hear you. Uh, the total today is a million one forty eight. And that includes the two hundred, the full two hundred and seventy-three thousand bequest. But some of that bequest was used for expenses of the project. That would be part of the thirty-six million dollar total. That is for extra design for sustainability, uh, and that that was reported to you earlier. I don't have that number in front of me, but it's it was not money that was spent. Uh, in addition to this project, it was spent towards the total cost of the project. Is that, like, is that confusing? Uh, Sharon? Yeah, I'm showing there's still 150, almost $151,000 in that account. So, uh, Kathy, does that answer your question? Okay, uh, anything else? I think that the other uh, part of the bundle of questions that we were gonna ask about at this point is to see if there's any uh, further questions people wanted to raise about the effect on the endowment. And then I, um, so I'll see if there's anybody who has anything that they wanted to raise on that. And if not, Kathy had raised some questions that uh, 
couldn't be answered at the last meeting because uh, Sharon couldn't be there and we were postponing them about the operating budget. And um, I wanted to um, then turn the question, turn, open that question up. So I don't know, uh, Kathy, do you want to restate your questions or um, how do you want to proceed with, because uh, I know that you had wanted to get them out today. Yeah, I, I'll try to, I will try to restate them. And I did see your responses, Sharon, and the repeated responses. What I was looking for when I asked about the operating budget is more similar to what the schools are doing, where they say, here's our current service level, the staffing level, the wages we're paying, the hours, the benefits. And they say, if we are planning on that staffing level, what budget do we get? And you had in the presentation to the council very nicely talked about how many full-time FTEs, part-time FTEs, you showed where they would be working in hours. So my question was, if that's the staffing we're gonna need to run the larger, the new and improved larger space, um, is there, what does that operating budget? So I was looking at, I don't know what the best word would be, um, pro forma, because I do understand that if you only get 2% of an increase, you then budget to just a 2% increase. But what's been happening because of the limited amounts of increases to operating budgets is, you know, part of a position has been, a whole full-time position has had to become a part-time or cut back in hours or shifts. So I wanted to see it built up from the bottom, not just to have a if it only goes up 2% of the year, I can do that math also. So I wanted to really see whether in 2026, 2027, whenever we reopen the library, you know, our, we've got contracts with step increases in them, best guess at the, the health insurance. We've been lucky on health insurance. I wanted to see it with your expected staffing, either staffing now, and that's and it's it's in reaction to what's been happening with schools that when we give a, a, a target amount of money, it often causes some um, this staff position or these hours have to be cut back. So that's what I wanted to get a sense of on a um, and that was in combination then with endowment that the endowment, thanks to the work you've done of building it up the draw on a endowment could be a bit higher if the town can only give this much. We've gotten, Sean is up at, uh, Sean and Paul are both on, we've got some penciled in what we think operating budgets can go up each year. Um, so that's what I was looking for and I still don't see it. And I realize that takes more work. Um, that's uh, yeah, it. no, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of work, uh, but no. So the school, the, the school budget is very different from the library budget and the library budget is very different from the school budget. The library budget doesn't work that way. Um, we will fund our, uh, our staffing how, however it is. We do not know in between now and even next year, or you know, three years from now, who's gonna leave, who's gonna stay, who's gonna be hired and at what rate they're gonna be hired. We don't have wage charts going out that far. So, at the end of the day, uh, what our, our cushion is the programming money. The staffing is required no matter what. We have to pay our electric bills. We have to uh, buy toilet paper, things like that. At the end of the day, it's the programming budget that would either get increased or decreased. And so um, it's, it, um, I, I'm asking that you think about it differently. Uh, it, it's it's not the same. It's not that I could, I can't do what you're what you're looking for. I guess is what I'm saying. We we are given on average a two percent increase every year, and and that's how that's how the budget is crafted every year. Okay, um, go with it. Sonia. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I can. I can kind of help clarify that I think, I hope Sharon, is if you think of the town's portion of the town's contribution to the Jones Library as sort of a, our state aid amount that we give them. So basically whatever the two and a half percent goes up every year, 2% goes up, we give that to the library. They use that as a funding source in their budget. Their payrolls 
we don't cover their full payrolls. They have part-time staff and everything, whatever they put on, if they add new employees, they're still held to that same percentage that the other operating budgets are. So if you think of it more as a funding source towards their operating budget, I think that would clarify it a little bit more. That's helpful, Sonia. And it's still, you know, if, if our contribution only goes up 2% per year, but the underlying staffing has step increases and other, then we won't keep up. So that's all I was looking for. So I can, I can totally understand the town side. So right. they, need, they need to make their budget work on their end. Yeah. And that's what making their budget work on their end to maintain. My, my concern is, can we maintain the opening hours of the library um, once it's open, as well as the opening hours of the branch and branches? And I, you know, as you know, the branches, especially North Amherst branch over the years has decreased. Um, you know, we, we're on limited hours, but much lower would be, well, it's limited. Not, Sharon, it's only one afternoon, one morning, one evening. It's about 20 hours a week that it's open. It used, when we first got here, this library was open all the time. So well, I've, only, I've only been in town for nine and a half years. And yeah, okay, during so. that time, it's been yeah. both branches are open 20 hours a week and that has not changed. Right, so it may not have changed in nine years, but I'm, I'm just, 15 hours would be hurtful. So I'm just, I was looking, that's what I was looking for in my questions. Um, and I realized that you then supplement it with friends money, with endowment money and other efforts. Um, so I was trying to get a sense of what was possible. And I, I do understand the answers I've been being given. I'm just thinking that in other agencies and similar, they do best guesses. You don't know the staffing, but you know the range of prices that you pay for wages and benefits. So that's that was my question, but I won't keep pounding at it. Alex? Yeah, so I think one of the, <laughs> one of the best, um, sort of in favor reasons for moving forward with a renovation and expansion is actually what it will do in terms of creating efficiencies. So think about the most inefficient structure you could possibly have for your employees, right? So, I mean, think about the most inefficient way to put books back on the shelves, to get books from CW Mars, from doing every single task that you do in a day. And if you could make it as completely inefficient as possible, that's where we are, right? And then imagine designing the way that your employees are able to do their jobs so that it creates efficiencies. Efficiencies in terms of how they monitor the public, efficiencies in terms of how they work with each other, efficiencies in terms of what they're able to do day to day. That's what the new building does. So when we seem sort of blasé about staff, it's because for us, we are creating efficiency. So our staffing doesn't change. The reality of a larger building for us means possibly more custodial work, and that's one staff. And for us, one plus staff, one minus staff, that's a budget year for us. Every year we deal with that. So for us, the operating budget, we see nothing but, you know, my maintenance budget's going to get better. My efficiencies are going to get better around staff. Everybody can do their job better. Happiness goes up in the building because, you know, staff can, is, is it, they're in a healthy, safe, friendly environment. So I would encourage you to change your thinking around a school budget, which has this impossible budget with state mandated requirements that aren't funded and a massive staff. And instead think about a much smaller operation that's creating efficiencies that's gonna make it so much better operationally for us. Thank, Thank you. you. That's helpful. Uh, Dorothy. I wanted to comment. Um, I was president of the Friends of the Library in Norfolk, Connecticut. And um, the libraries don't run the way the schools do. And, and like in Amherst, the building was privately owned and had a good endowment actually a very good endowment. And there was some money from the town to help with staff, but it's no, there's no comparison between a library staffing budget and a school. The library staff is not as highly organized, regulated, unionized. And um, <laughs> if we, if we, I, I know, but it isn't. Um, and uh, if there was more money needed, then we raised it, okay? The friends raised it. 
And also in Norfolk, if you died, it was understood that you had to leave some money to the library and people did even if they didn't read books. So um, the cuts in the school budget are often a, a political organizing tool to get the public to be up in an uproar and say, you've got to restore money. And that money often does get restored. We've already had a notice that things turned out a little bit better. And we, and we are going to be able to not uh, to bring the school budget up to two instead of two and a half percent. But in a school budget, you don't include the PTA money in the budget. Um, in libraries, the PTA money or the friends money or whatever it is that's raised is what pays for the programs. And um, there's, a, there's a real connection there. So I, I don't see a good clear comparison between the school budgets and library budgets. That's it. Anything more to be said on budgets? I mean, I was, uh, uh, I must say, um, kind of moved by staff statements over quite a number of presentations about the inefficiencies of the current building and the, in, in the difficulty of supervising and overseeing a building that is not laid out in a logical fashion. And uh, I have uh, appreciated the presentations that have been made by your architects um, as to, and, and, your, and your staff and all of the, uh, everybody about how the new building can be more uh, better supervised um, and there can be better vigilance of what's happening in the building without increasing staff. So, I mean, that was kind of how I had looked at it. Anything else on this subject before we go on to see if there's anything else that people want to raise about fundraising budget questions, um, the building ownership issue. I'll throw one additional one in there to see if there's anything that um, is left to ask on that subject. Seeing at this point that there are no additional questions, um, then I want to get back to see if there are any further questions regarding the design and repair options. Um, and uh, this is a good time because we now have uh, Elon with us. So uh, what, if there are, I want to see if there are questions about uh, the design repair options that were left over from last meeting that people feel that they need follow up on. Anything from the committee on that subject is uh, then uh, I just want to make sure because um, we'll want to get into questions of the memorandum of understanding and the orders um, is. Um, final, but I want to make sure, uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, it, mine is not a question as much as just a thank you. I saw that staff, Sean and the finance people, they gave us the different way of looking at the option two, and they addressed Bob's concern that one of the numbers looked about three times bigger than it should be. So I feel like we have we have a good good cash flow comparisons over time for the two. And, you know, I, I see that sometimes you assume there's a bond premium and sometimes you don't, even if it's financed in, in the same year, but I can understand that those are just two ways of looking at it. So I, I just think Andy, when, when, and if we write, write up this back end report, we're just going to have to make that clear to people because that's been confusing to the public that how if you need to raise 15.8 million in one case you only do 15 and you get a premium and the other you raise it all you know so it's it you can see it over in the interest rate that the interest rate evens it out but i just think a few sentences that people don't think 
the math in some way was biasing the result because the results are just showing two different ways. So thank you for doing that. Andy, can Go I on. make one quick comment? Yeah, and I agree with Kathy. I think you know, in the in the final report, you know, you may want to create a table that just shows the total costs for each option. You'll have the cash flow statements as backup, um, but focusing on sort of the, the total costs for all the years would sort of take out that bond premium piece of it to make it a little less confusing. Of course, we'll rely on you to help us out with that too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kathy. Just have more. You're muted, just so uh, you know. Sorry, that was just my. I didn't lower that little blue hand. It's down now. Okay. So, um, are there other questions that uh, want to be raised about the different options? Um, because uh, I know that we had requests from some people um, to leave, and I wanted to. Um, and Lynn, is there anything else that you think we need to talk about before we get into the memorandum of understanding and orders part of the discussion, which really, I don't think we need to hold all of um, the people that Sharon has asked to join us um, for that discussion? Um, no, but I, I just want to comment on a report that has to come from this committee. Uh, I hope it doesn't have to be lengthy because frankly, 60 pages of questions and answers could be more than sufficient as a report. And so I really would hate to see Andy and Kathy as vice president spend a whole lot more time trying to create yet a different way of saying it. No, I was not planning to. We'll get to that later it's, it's at the conclusion. You I do wanna, have one uh, audience question, and I don't know whether you want to pause here, Andy, and take time. Okay, maybe we can do that since we do need to do. Um, public comment and. Um, before I go to that Kathy your hand just, is up again. Just a quick Lynn, Lynn I completely agree, you know that attaching this there are a couple places. In, in the document that we have. So one example is last time we heard that there was 1.8 million that was found in soft costs and 400,000 of it was furniture. So we were told that we'd get a brief discussion at this meeting of the other one, where's the other 1.4, just a general. I don't think we were looking for line items. And then the other piece, and Alex did an excellent uh, memo to us. Um, I met yesterday uh, with both people from Colliers and Alex was there and Sharon to just try to get a sense of what contingency had been built into the budget. And we now have th those minutes from Alex. And I think that answers those questions. Um, and so I, I think we can just, they were outstanding questions. I said, we'll talk about it later, but the 1.8 million, I don't think we have, a minimal, if we can just get a quick explanation of what beyond the $400,000 in furniture that was. And I, I think we should bring that up now so that we can incorporate it into the 60 page document. Sure, and I can actually, um, I can actually pull that up and share my screen if possible. I can show you which line items were um, reduced and by what amounts to be able to facilitate that one point eight million dollars in uh, in the change that that Kathy is referencing. Um, if you give me one moment, I can pull that up. Okay. okay. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. So this form should look fairly familiar to everybody. Um, this is what we've shared previously. Uh, and as you can see here, um, I showed the numbers that are that we've reduced. Um, show up here on the sidebar where we've reduced the FF&E um, by the dollar value shown, 400.6. 
um, we re reduce the architect fees. And again, yeah. some some of these are are a result of the the dollar values going down. They're formulaic, so some of these have been reduced purely by the formula of the construction number um, uh, re reduction as well. So. Um, Project management, our OPM fees have been reduced. Building commissioning uh, services was reduced. We reduced printing costs by a nominal fee. Uh, most of the stuff that goes out on the street nowadays is all done online. So the reduction uh, just makes sense to reduce that. Uh, consultant reimbursables was also reduced. And again, that's a product of, that's uh, A&E reimbursables. So that's a product of the A&E, &E, the architect's fees going down also reduced the uh, consultant reimbursables accordingly. Then construction and owner's project contingencies were reduced as well. So that's what gets us to the total uh, $1.8 million. Thank you. So uh, are there members of the committee who wish to be uh, Lynn? I just want to make sure, um, Ken, thank you for that. This is the table that we have in the answers and questions, questions and answers, right? Uh, I'm not sure if this particular one with the sidebar comments uh, where it was distributed, uh, but I can distribute that out to you if, you, if need be. I know that this analysis was distributed, but maybe without the sidebar comments. Yeah. I think it would be terrific if you did, and then we will include that instead of the table that is already there. Sure. Okay, well, thank you. So what I'm gonna do now, um, since I know there's a member of the public who is just recognized, we have in the agenda um, a public comment period, and this might be a good time to um, turn to the public um, to see if there's anybody who has um, any comments or questions that they wish to, um, bring forward for the, our comments for the committee. And uh, so if um, any members of the public um, who are in attendance wish to um, speak, then uh, they should raise their hand now so that I know how many we have. And then um, I will allot a period of time um, to, um, in, and initially ask um, that Athena bring Rudy Perkins into the room for the moment so that, um, and Rudy should uh, need to unmute yourself and um, and I give you two or three minutes to uh, tell us what you would like us to know. Chair, Chair Steinberg, can you he hear me? I'm on my I cell. Can. Yes, okay. I can. Um, I actually just had a, I'm getting an echo. Uh, I had a quick question while Ms. Tierney was here. Uh, the repair option, do you know about how much of that budget is going to repairing gas-fired uh, heating equipment of various kinds? I, I was going through the budget and I couldn't sort of pull out the lines. Huh? Uh, it, even ballpark. Uh, I, I can't tell you that off the top of my head. I need to pull up the uh, cost estimate breakdown. So if you have other questions, give me a couple minutes to look that up. Well, I had some comments. If this is when you want comments, uh, Chair Steinberg. Um, yes, or I can wait ahead. on them. In, in the... Uh, do, they, do you need to, can you go ahead and give the comments before you get the response? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, one of the things I noticed in the amended additional information was that on page 11 at question 12, there was a discussion of a second cost estimate being done and reconciled with the other cost estimate before going on to design development. And I haven't seen any second cost uh, estimate and reconciliation. And I wondered when we're expecting that. And that seems like a good thing to know to make sure our construction number is, is solid before you make your decision. 
So that was one question. I noticed that the um, architect and, and um, maybe Mr. Alexander can clarify, on June 26th issued new drawings that had a different square gross square footage that increased above the uh, square footage given in the fantasy updated estimate. So it would buy about 1500 square feet. And obviously the square footage affects the cost estimate, it affects the EUI uh, analysis. So I'm wondering um, where that square footage now sits and whether the, if the second cost estimate hasn't been done, if that could be given to them the updated number to make sure they're working off of that. Um, and then I have some comments about the budget comparison. So I'm very uh, concerned about dramatic reductions in the contingencies, um, which you've clarified today. That was something of my, est my own estimate. And um, the original MBA application gave an 11.5% construction contingency estimate and a 10% soft cost contingency estimate. Um, my experience, A, that was done by our own library experts. So I assume there was a reason for those two contingencies. I'm my own background as an affordable housing developer. We wouldn't have used a three to 5% construction contingency. I haven't looked to see what you've effectively done here. Um, for a project that involved a lot of rehab of an old building, it's just too risky in my view. So um, I think those need to, those numbers need, need to be restored to a more realistic level, at least to the level they were at in the 2016 estimate per your columns. And that adds about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars maybe more now by your new numbers um it didn't look to me like there was escalation for your ff and e number in the budget and there was in the original mblc application and that that could add look my rough take was about two hundred five thousand for two years of escalation um the fees, the original explanation for why that didn't have an escalation line item, the way the MBLC application budget did, was that those tend to escalate by the OPM's automatic formulas based on the construction cost. But we've seen, in fact, that the numbers have gone down. So there was no escalation built into those formulas. And if you escalate all the other fees too, it looks to me like you've, you should be adding about $375,000 in uh, escalation for the fees line. So um, maybe you've negotiated lower rates with people already. I don't know what, what of our contracts are locked in for the, for the duration and what, which ones aren't. But that seemed like a sort of unrealistic uh, omission or, or reduction. And then there's a lot of numbers you know, I sort of send questions that get at these about legal costs, bridge financing costs, if there's any, um, any, any cost study or any study on the strong building and what vibration mitigation we're going to have to do. Um, and uh, I think there's some other costs too, uh, bridge financing, uh, legal costs we got. So I just think that the budget is unrealistically low the way it is now, a, at least a million and a half low. And you might say, what's a million and a half in a, this big a budget? Well, a million and a half could mean all of your adopted ECMs, your CLT, maybe your automatic book handling machine, your roof solar, all the features that brought you down to EUI 29. And those energy features are being used to sell this expansion to members of the public. It's one of the reasons I started paying attention to the library project. Um, and I would hate to see us back into too low a budget that we then had to come back and cut things out of, especially energy features that were used to sell this project to the public. So I would prefer, may not be the easiest thing to do, 
give us a realistic and transparent budget. And then you're probably going to have to raise more money to get to it. And if the project, the project has many noble features, um, you may just have to do that. But coming back later and taking out things, that's going to be hard. Thank Rudy, you. thank you. Um, it's a good rough, but I do want to uh, yeah. come back. And I don't know, Ken, if you're the one who's going to be the um, start the response. Uh, but I want to, I mean, a number of questions have been asked about um, confidence level in the budgeting process. And um, you're, and so can you, do you want to start with that? Sure, I can ask, answer the first question first, I think, which was um, had to do with the estimates and when the next estimate and the estimate reconciliation would happen. That would happen after the design development phase. So we would be doing another estimate round of estimates and reconciliation at design development, as well as during the construction document phase to ensure again that we're conforming to budget prior to moving on to the next phase. Uh, as far as the budget um, itself is concerned, our, and I think I mentioned this in one of our previous meetings, our um, budget is, is, is quite a bit different. Our budget layout, our budget items are quite a bit different than what the MBLC is looking for. Um, our budget, we ended up having to, um, you know, put our numbers into the MBLCs uh, formulaic, their formulaic spreadsheet for their use. So the contingencies are spread out differently. They're looked at differently. Um, we've got our contingencies at the bottom line. It's, it's typically we're at 5% of construction costs for both construction contingency and owner's contingency. Um, that's something that we have to adjust. Again, one of the things that we were mandated to do as part of this exercise was to look at the budget holistically, that the budget would not change dramatically other than the ad alternate for the for the timber framing and uh, those ECMs. So um, we had to adjust the budget line items somewhere to account for that delta. And so the contingency was one of them. Um, the, the fees that I showed you are another one. Those fees are a product of a formula that comes off the construction cost. So whether it's say 4% for OPM fees or 10% or 12% for the architect fees, those fees adjust based on the construction phase, uh, on the construction dollars. Um, we did have to adjust those down based on the fact that we were looking at a budget delta and um, we were, we were um, directed to ensure that we weren't going over the, the, the budget as a whole. Uh, some of those other key items that are in there, uh, the FF&E um, again was another one that was a formulaic um, a budget number, we overrode that formula and had to reduce that accordingly as well. Um, some of the other line items that we have not touched, such as the uh, temporary locations um, and the costs associated with that, those are unknowns right now. We're having, we have a placeholder in there that could, that could vary uh, tremendously. There is another contingency that's built into the construction numbers that I think it's important to understand. It's been talked about previously and that's the design and pricing contingency which has been um, noted to be part of the estimator's estimate. And essentially what that is, is that's uh, allowing for the design to complete. So right now the design is about 20%, let's say, and the design and pricing contingency is dollar value that's in there that allows the design to complete. And essentially what happens is that dollar value just moves up into the construction line items and gets to zero by the time it's ready for bid time. So it's moved up into the construction line items for the next estimates and reduces accordingly. We are gonna to have to look hard at, at cost management solutions and ensuring that we're gonna have a viable project on bid day. I talked about these previously with ad alternates. Uh, believe me, if, you know, if, if, if we could get an additional $2 million for the project, I don't think there's an OPM out there that wouldn't say, no, I don't want the money, uh, we can't use it. But uh, again, we are comfortable. The owner's contingency that's currently shown is for betterments and for soft costs improvements. So those that's another line item that may or may not be, be touched. The construction contingency is for all those incidentals and those unforeseen conditions. And based on the, the design team that we have for this project, uh, they've been through these projects in these historical um, preservation and restoration projects year over year. 
they know what they're doing. Uh, we're giving them plenty of time to do an adequate design and to do whatever sort of uh, investigative work and due diligence we need to do to try to ensure that the, the majority of the hidden items and unforeseen conditions that would impact our construction contingency are accounted for. And, and honestly, that's that's kind of the mandate that we've been given and that's that's what we've set ourselves up to do at this point. Um, so yeah, I understand that there's concerns about the budget, but um, that's the budget that we, we have and we're gonna manage to that budget. Um, one, one additional thing that um, the caller had question asked about was uh, uh, anything that's unique to the project because it is partially reconstruction of an existing facility and it's not all a new facility. And um, his comments were based upon um, house, uh, affordable housing projects that he had worked on that he was referencing. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, You've considered that and it's based on experience that you're bringing us that um, you feel comfortable with the contingency amounts for the project as you know it is. Given the design team we have in place right now, I feel comfortable with the contingency line items we have. If it was a different designer that hadn't done this many, many times over and over, that'd be a different story. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Alexander. Yeah, just to build on that, I think, you know, we're all feeling the pressure of the budget, you know, and I think that's uh, something we always have to go through with every project. And I think this especially, we have a renovation and in addition, we've done this, as, as Ken said, lots of times before, that doesn't mean every project isn't different. We are really concerned that we get the cost estimate under control, but, it, but I need to say that we, we can't keep pushing the same information around, which is why we have to get to a design development or a next, a next phase, if there's going to be one, where we can redo the budget, reconcile it with the OPM and our own estimator and make adjustments if we have to uh, at that point. Um, at that point, you know, there's money being spent on fees, but that's that's all. So, I mean, I think it's that we feel confident we can do this, but we do need a lot of cooperation to make it happen. And we've had great cooperation so far. And on the energy items, we would hate to lose them, but remember the even the building we have without the ECMs is down to an EUI of, of 34, which is half of the existing building and half of most of your library in the country. So, you know, I think we're not planning on eliminating those, but you're still getting a highly efficient uh, building, all electric. And I think that's still very important to remember. But so we really plan to work with everyone there to get this, make sure this budget is where we think it is. But we do need to do much more information to test that accurately. So. So I'm going to um, ask the committee uh, present and maybe from the trustees or representing the trustees if there are any more questions or comments about the whole budget for um, in the budget process, assuming the uh, that we're going forward with the uh, renovation and addition process, because if Andy, Aileen's hand is up. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to answer Rudy's first question. Yeah, I was going to go back to you because the first question gets back. I had separated it out because we're going back to the repair questions then, which was what you were looking something up for him. So go ahead. Okay. So um, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection was listed as a little over $4 million in our budgets. And of that, uh, $1,488,782 was the mechanical portion. Um, and of that, it looks like about $540,000 was uh, gas-fired equipment. That 
it's a quick calculation. There's a lot of uh, detail breakdown in the cost estimate, but that's the ballpark, which I think is what Rudy was looking for. Okay, now are there other questions that people would like to raise about the uh, repair alternatives that haven't been previously addressed? So I'm back to the question as to whether there's anything else that um, any members of the committee want to ask further about that relate to any subject other than the MOU and the proposed orders, because um, uh, once we make that switch, I want to be able to um, thank everybody who came today for being here, but um, not everybody, anybody's welcome to stay for the entire discussion, but they don't need to stay for that portion. So I want to make sure that if you have questions that um, need to go to people who might leave, that this is the last chance. Dorothy. Okay, I have, I have a weird question. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was hoping to ask at a later time was if there's a possibility of putting the Civil War tablets in the library because it would have climate control, the security would be great, and it would be open to people uh, and the public uh, many hours. But then I thought, well, does the floor have to have special reinforcement? I don't know what they weigh, but they are big granite stones. And um, I didn't know if, since we had all these technical people here, whether that was something they might know. Thank you. Sharon. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for asking Dorothy. Yes, ever since, uh, Ever since John Musanti and Sandy Pooler attended a meeting in our uh, our Woodbury room many years ago, at this point, uh, the plan has been that once we uh, once we expand and renovate, that the silver the Civil War tablets would find a new home in the expanded Jones Library, and they will be um, on the basement level uh, at, at the entrance to special collections. That's the plan. I I don't know if Jim Alexander wants to talk more about that than that. No, I think that's fine. And I think having it at the lowest level, you know, it allows us to solve the structural problems without any uh, great concern, actually. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. Thank you. And just uh, as an update on that, we did uh, have uh, uncovered the Civil War tablets there. We put them on special um, A-frame uh, structures and they they're in pristine condition they weigh about 600 pounds each mm -hmm. um and so they will be officially unveiled in this temporary location in the banks community center on juneteenth so that's really exciting and, and they are it's just a moving to see them and they're just they're just like you see these things in every other small town um but ours are perfectly preserved so mm -hmm. it's really exciting great okay so Dorothy, thank you for asking that question. Anything else? So Lynn, do you anything else to uh, Council President you want to cover before we move on to those subjects of uh, the MOU and orders and with the understanding that um, then our experts who need need to leave, certainly we appreciate their being here. Uh, let me just mention that this will come before the council on uh, Monday the 5th. Uh, we will have a public hearing at 630. That public hearing will cover both. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a public forum. It will cover both the CPA money for the library and the overall appropriation. And so we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to make any of other comments at that point. Uh, I'll work with Sharon to determine um, if and how many of our consultants we need to have with us. I, but I uh, hope that the council who has been receiving all of the questions and answers uh, will take the time to look them over and um, not, they pretty much look to the finance committee, but this is a very, very, very important vote on behalf of the council. 
That's it. Okay. So, um, appreciate that. It, Sharon, you can follow up with uh, Lynn on that later if you want. Um, so anything else? And if not, I want to um, thank everybody who um, was present. I'm not going to try and go through the list of names and uh, accidentally forget somebody. So, um, but a uh, number of you from uh, uh, Colliers and from the architecture, two architecture firms is working on the two different options um, and trustees, you've uh, all been very, very helpful and um, helped the finance committee and helped the council as a whole to really have the information to really fully understand and uh, respond to some of the public questions that we have heard. Um, so uh, I um, don't think we'd be ready to go to the Monday meeting without the help you've provided and the information you've provided. So I thank you very much. And uh, everybody is welcome to stay, but we are going to uh, then switch to topics of the memorandum of understanding and the proposed orders. So thank you. Uh, so turning to that, um, Lynn, I don't know what we're going, which version you have to put out, but um, there was a red line version that um, was sent out very late in the day that was the counts uh, that the trustees had asked us to look at. And um, the changes, a lot of the changes, and uh, <clears throat> any. Uh, Sharon can explain, or Alex can explain what they are, but I think that they're fairly um, straightforward. And uh, but it is shifting wording from trustees to library in a number of places. I'll and show that version, and I think that's probably the easiest at this point. Yeah, and then I had uh, one additional suggestion of a change that I sent back when I did. Um, which uh, had been in a prior version, but um, I just added it to a, besides I don't know which version you have, but I'll let you choose which one to put, uh, put out there for discussion. Andy, are you saying there is one that is later than the March 29th memo we got from Lynn? Yes. Okay. I think, I uh, don't know if it was got sent to the rest of the committee or not. Uh, the trustees um, met this morning. Did not get sent to everyone. I, I don't think we got anything. I'd like to see it. And I will get <laughs> getting it for you as fast as I can. Um, Yeah, I don't know if um, I have several members of the trustees present and Sharon is present still if any uh, of them would raise their hand to um, give explanation of this morning's meeting discussion. Certainly, I will uh, want to make sure that they get recognized promptly. I'll send this along to people as well, but this is the version that we got after the trustees meeting this morning. So as you see the top of it, um, it is uh, in part putting just structuring a little bit of the change so that it's uh, clearly in agreement with the library acting through the trustees. And as you move down, 
you'll see a substitutions that have been made in a number of places. Can you go up to the top again, Jean Lynn? I'm just comparing it to the wording we got yesterday. This, this was edited to that version, Kathy. Okay, it's a little bit diff. Okay, because before we were making it, the town was making an agreement with Jones Library Inc. and the Board of Trustees. Now right. it's through the Board of Trustees. Right. Okay. Okay. Ready to move to the next? Yep. Um, I understand the change, and I'm going to ask why. I'm going to wait to see all the changes and then ask some whys, but I have more issues with the content. So this is what you said, Andy, we're regularly, this is regularly substituting the word, we're making an agreement with something called a library, which is a corporation, um, as opposed to with the trustees. Is that correct? That's what, uh, and again, that's what the uh, trustees requested as of this morning. And uh, so I'm, we're, just going through this and as a This is really the only sentence that has been added by the trustees. The rest are mostly that switch. Yep. So, um, to, Andy, I think back there, because we, we were doing it on the fly, I think the library share due date as a definition probably was taken out inadvertently under uh, go up to the due date, six. I think that term may have been taken out inadvertently. Sharon or Bob can tell me if I'm reading too quickly, but I don't think that was meant to be removed. Really all that was changed in this paragraph is adding remainder. The shall be paid in full is deleted and put back. So it's really just remainder of. I agree with Alex, thank you. So basically we didn't need to do anything here. Yeah, you could, you could I mean, you could, reject the shall be paid in full and or yeah because that's just and then we'll accept it whatever it's the same thing <laughs> it was just adding the remainder of 
It was just a clarification that we're not paying twice. <laughs> and Lynn, I have one other, this is Sean, I have one other difference yes. um, when you have a second. Let's wait a minute and just see if the trustees have anything else they want to say about this. So everything else remains the same, except down here. And I want to clarify, Alex, um, you're not having all the trustees sign. Um, yeah, we didn't discuss that removal, but I think the idea was that the treasurer, um, you know, and the president, but I don't think that's a I don't think anybody was particularly caring one way or the other. I think they were just trying to be consistent. Yep, got it. And I don't know whether really I should be signing it as the secretary or whether the treasurer should be signing it because it's the endowment. I mean, I think that's, I think that's all, you know, whatever makes the most sense. My experience is that documents that like this usually just require two board signatures. I would think that there should be a certificate of vote on file that the trustees have authorized these two individuals to sign this. And that should be in the trustees vote. Yep. Yep, got that. Alex, you have that? Yeah, and, and Bob actually mentioned it this morning in our in our meeting minutes, which I think you were sent as well, so yes. Lynn, can you scroll up to the bottom of the page four, please? Up. Up. Uh, that you're at five to five. There we go. Right there. Hold, hold it right there, please. <clears throat> All right. Telecopy documents. All right. That's fine. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Spell check didn't like the words telecopied and docu sign, but mm -hmm. I decided to let them go. Um, Let's take any further comments from the trustees. Yeah. And then That's right. Look at what other people have to say. So, anybody from the trustees want to add anything? I that was where I was going to go to. So, this is Bob Pam. <clears throat> part of the part of the reason for the change from the trustees to the library incorporated is that um, what, well, we are, we are elected officials. We move, we change from time to time. This is a long-term agreement and we should be binding the organization. And so the, the appropriate way to do that seemed to be to say that it is the Jones Library Inc, which is making this decision, which is signing this and which is bound by it. Um, long after I or anybody else on the board is gone. Anybody else from the trustees? If not, I want to um, open it up to the committee. And there's one additional um, thing that I had brought up previously. I would have to share screen to actually show it. I can um, find it for you, Andy, if you want to just wait a minute, because uh, I do have it. And it was, um, I'll tell you what it was, is that um, under the CPA fund section, and I was sorry that I didn't think about this earlier than a few, because um, it was really just a day or two ago that I talked to Lynn about it. In the CPA fund section, that um, we didn't say that the award would be for the special collections area of the library renovation edition. So I, um, that was, it was just to add a little bit of language um, to at least to think about it so that that was uh, clear. And, 
And I would say from the trustees perspective, I mean, what we voted on this morning was the, the what the main intentions are behind it. And to me, this doesn't change that. So I don't think it's something, I mean, obviously we'll take the final language back, but I don't foresee that as problematic unless you feel differently, Bob. I think it's just clarification of the agreement. So the way that I had read, uh, I'm looking at my copy and not at what Lynn has on the screen right now, but um, so there was, uh, it would read uh, under the CPA fund sections from the CPA for the special collections area of the library renovation addition to be applied toward the total project cost. Um, those were the words that I finally come up to add. So can I just, can I ask on that, if Sonia is still here, she had said that she, in, in a CPA award, that invoices would have to come in and go through CPA. So does this still work that it can be deposited with the town treasurer? So it's just an account that is being drawn on? Yes. Okay. So Andy, did I get your all the language. Um, let me just get back to where I was. I'll read it one last time and you can compare it as I do. Um, so that I can't look at both at the same time. So uh, the town council has appropriated funds in the amount of a million dollars from the CPA for the special collections area of the library renovation addition to apply to be applied toward. Okay, we got it. All right, so, so from the uh, finance committee, there's been two things. One is that there be a motion that the president and the trustee be allowed to sign this. And the second one is Andy's addition here. There have been a lot of, and of course, all of the um, changes. And then there was the one substantive change was the um, addition of some language about the library, uh, Friends of the Library, continuing to do fundraising for other purposes. Right. And that was beyond the question of making it an agreement of the light with the library as opposed to the trustees. So um, if we understand where the where we are now um, and there's nothing else that I, I don't see any hands up from the trustees, I'll turn it over as ask Kathy. Okay. Um, yeah, I have um, some substantive uh, questions about it, and these are all toward trying to make the um, wording stronger uh, to protect the town. Um, so on the, the town's right and remedy, or one of these paragraphs, here's the, the basic question. Um, I understood the response to the library that we can't just... Um, take a part of the endowment and put it in a fund because they'd have to liquidate funds and it would be low interest bearing. But my understanding of where the endowment is, is at fidelity and you could take a proportionate share of, if you're in a, a international fund or whichever fund and move it into a separate account and earmark that is under the town's control so that you would put up, be basically putting up collateral. So I think that would make this stronger rather than an assurance that um, the right, it says right now in seven, the right to compel the library to use the endowment to pay the library share. I would prefer something that said to set aside X, whether it's $2 million of the endowment, but in an account not to liquidate it, but to still have it be managed over at Fidelity, which would just be called a, an escrow account. I don't understand why that couldn't be done. Um, and I think that would be a firmer, that would be the equivalent of, well, it's, it's as near as I can think of as putting up collateral because you can't promise to put, um, uh, take a loan out against the building to pay. 
So, so that was a question on making this stronger. And then I'll just do my other one when I was reading it through. Um, Cause compel, I think it implies that but it doesn't actually say what would happen. Then in the um, number eight, the restriction, which we're saying that the library will be entrusted as a free library, the benefit initially for 30 years why not in perpetuity? Why are we not saying this is a public library in perpetuity, right? I understand that CPA or others may, may sometimes say 30 years is long enough, but if we're, we're in this relationship with a nonprofit entity that has a trust board of trustees, it's not a town owned building. And so why not in this say in initially, instead of initially for 30, years, why not in perpetuity? So those were my questions, um, both trying to secure this agreement and turn it into more contract-like where there is some remedy uh, um, and we have some uh, course. You know, I'm clearly, I'm very hopeful that the trustees will raise all the money they've said they will raise and the, and the historic tax credits will come in and the two grants that, grants that they plan to play for will appear, <laughs> but um, it is the 6.6 .6 million. The only thing that's completely sure, clear about it right now is, um, well, the 7.6, Kent said, is the 1 million from CPA, the rest. So those are my two, uh, I think those are my two biggies. And I was trying to figure out exactly where to put those. I mean, this document is clearly assuming, it's Pat's, original question that CPA comes on top of the 15.751. So we're in effect, this MUA, MOU is agreeing to that. Um, and that to me was always a subject to a council decision, whether that counted. And it clearly, if it didn't count, um, the library share is higher. Uh, so I wasn't gonna go back in the other parts because that is, um, a separate issue. So I just was focused on number six um, or seven, you know, I'm putting an escrow in, in an escrow account. So that that's it. Bernie? My two main ones. Bernie, you muted. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah no. fumbling with my uh, fumbling with my mouse here. Um, I guess I'm more trusting to the trustees than uh, others. Uh, I, I would, the idea about taking some of the ten, uh, the library's endowment and tucking it away, I thought Vanguard was managing it, um, who knows, um, tucking it away in a, in a separate account, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna involve an ownership change and that may be a bigger deal um, that has some adverse effect on the endowment than um, whoever the, whoever the, in, the in, uh, Who's ever holding the funds can, you know, can tell the trustees that. But I, I don't know if you're going to get that answer very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so that's just a just a caution about that. Uh, and and I also think there's probably some challenges with trying to attach that money in some way, manner, or form. So we we do have a trust issue here, and um, I, I understand that people want guarantees, um, but I think there's going to be an ownership issue if you want to move some of that money. Um, and I'm not. I mean, 30 years, um, I guess I'm agnostic as to whether this is 30 years or, or in perpetuity because uh, um, I, I'm, I'm trusting that well beyond that, that building will function that will function as a library or some other public resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I guess, uh, and I'm just gonna say that I, I if I might, Andy, this is Bob Pam. Okay, go. You can go ahead, Bob. Okay. I'll see uh, I'm, I'm not tomorrow. authorized to negotiate on this, but um, are you asking for six and a half million dollars in an escrow account? That seems no, no, might, uh, might a little difficult. No, no. I, I, I was thinking, Bob. I was going to get specific. You know, with more like put two million. You had said up to two million could be loaned out, could be whatever. So I was going to put a specific amount as the security here. Not, not take your nine. Take a take a piece of it. 
that was it. And I'm not sure how much difficulty I'd, I'd need to get a uh, financial fidelity. I have, we have our personal accounts there. It's not been that difficult to set up an ownership with a different name and move shares over of different pieces when we've done it. So I realize this would be a different relationship because it, it'd be the town co-owning it in some way, but it wasn't, it wasn't that difficult to do, to do that. Um, but yes, there was a, a temporary ownership change. So, but not, but definitely not the whole endowment. It was putting up a, a piece. Well, this is Vanguard, not Fidelity. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Case, oh, so, so Vanguard. So I don't know whether Vanguard. In case, yeah, I, um, I don't know what would be involved in this. Um, I can try to imagine it. The, the one that I really have problems with is in perpetuity because this is an agreement with respect to a particular address. And uh, you know, assuming 50 years from now there is you know, an earthquake or whatever, and the town library is now put into another building, this, this agreement is with, clearly with respect to 43 Amity. Hmm? Andy, I can't raise my hand. Um, yeah, no, I saw that, so I, uh, so I said your name to recognize you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me go in reverse order. On the 30 years, um, MBLC requires that the library agree to maintain the library for 20 years. Uh, CPA requires 30. The loan, we don't know for sure yet, but right now, Sean has been estimating it to be done over a 20 year period. So what we did was choose the out year, which was 30. And that was the rationale for the 30. Uh, I wanna speak to the number seven though. Uh, and I, I'm going to speak to this from my perspective of being uh, the chair of the investment committee for another nonprofit. And that is while you could certainly approach the fiduciary, in this case, Vanguard, and ask them to label a certain amount of money for um, you know, eventually possible payment and that would have to be voted by the trustees and so forth. To actually remove that money and not make the interest available to the library cuts down their flexibility over the period of time. And we have all been very concerned about making sure we maintain that flexibility for the library to use their trust funds. And so the compromise in here instead, and I'm going to just flip to another part of the report, was to require this annual reporting of various things associated with nonprofits that basically speak to its public, its health. And these are the standard forms that are filed by all nonprofits, the CPC, uh, et cetera. And in this case, we would also ask, and it's financial statements, we would also ask for a variety of other things, including their pledges, receipts of funds, et cetera, et cetera. So it allows the um, town manager, if needed, be shared with the town council to at least annually be checking up on the health of this particular nonprofit rather than mess with its money. That's all I have to say. And I guess that I had one additional point and so go back up to number seven where we were at the beginning because I want to point out the second portion of that which you've highlighted in blue. Uh, you know, my experience in negotiating uh, similar kinds of agreements, uh, the uh, the, how you enforce it in the end, if you need to enforce it, and the um, rights of the town um, to be reimbursed for um, costs and expenses uh, that it might incur, including um, attorney's fees, I think gives a sufficient area of comfort that I have absolutely uh, no hesitation 
on my own on feeling that we are secured in this agreement. Andy, so I don't know if there are other comments or suggestions. Yeah, I'm looking to see if there are any other hands going up or. So um, is there a general comfort level with um, the MOU? I just can I. Yeah, okay. Andy, I just want to ask, so what you're saying is the word compel has a great deal of meaning, meaning to it. So um, that's what I was looking for is, you know, you know, as Bob said, if, if they didn't come up with, he, he was worried about, you know, if they didn't come up with the 5.6 million that we'd come after the endowment for all of it, well, we're, we're certainly hoping that there's more certainty than that. Um, you know, so I would shall compel is is what I was looking for on a if we wrote a contract with an entity with that, what would a judge think? And and Bernie, I'm not saying I don't trust. I'm saying this is a lot of money. Um, and will we later get a what did what did the word compel mean? How much money were we talking about? Um, so that's where, and, and Lynn, I, I hear what you're saying that you wanna be careful how you do this. And it was certainly not trying to stop the flow into the operating budget. But um, you know, when the 1993 edition was built, the library sold a painting to help pay their share. Um, I don't think they have another valuable painting or extremely valuable furniture anymore to offer up as collateral. So I'm just wondering, the endowment is, I think, the collateral. So that, that's all I'm saying. And I, I have a feeling this is going to go out as written. Um, and I will probably say it again Monday night because I'm concerned this, isn't, this is not strong enough for protecting the town side, even if we totally trust all the intentions here. The intentions are to raise money and secure some grants. And we certainly hope that will all work and everyone will be happy. That's, that's it. I, so I'm asking about how strong is this wording? Um, go back to Bernie and then Alex. Bernie? Yeah, really quick, uh, has KP Law reviewed this document? This was KP Law's document to begin with. Okay, that's, I, I, I think we're sufficiently protected. Alex? Yeah, so Kathy, so the remedies clause is a hammer clause, right? So we are not mutually indemnifying each other. So if this were a contract that I was negotiating, right? There would be an indemnification provision for us as well. So it is a one-sided hammer clause that allows you to compel us if we do not pay. So we have a $9 million endowment. We own a building, right? We, we are not poor of assets. So we can take a loan out on our, we can take a mortgage out on our building. We have our endowment. We have multiple options in terms of how to meet the obligations that the trustees have said that they would meet if there is a shortfall between what we're able to raise and what we commit to. So the, the part about this is there's language in here that we're gonna pay for everything, right? So if you have to, there's no reason for you not to pursue if we don't comply and pay because we have to pay all of your attorney's fees. We've gotta pay every cost associated with it. So for the trustees to sort of dig in their heels and say, I'm not gonna pay, I mean, it's, it's not even a trust issue. I mean, th this is a remedy clause. That's the purpose of this clause is to make it so unpalatable for us to not put up our end of the bargain that it just doesn't make any sense. And that's exactly what that language does. So I think your concern is valid, but, but that is what that is for. Um, and I speak from experience on this because this is what I did for 20 years. So, um, I, you know, 
if I were negotiating this and I felt like we were adversaries and we were hiring our own counsel, it would be much stronger protection for the trustees. But I think this is a really good faith effort for the library to show our commitment to the town um, that's backed up by an endowment and a building that we own. Andy? Yes. Um, just looking at the words one more time, it says the word shall. It says all, shall have all available rights and remedies. And then it says including the right to compel. So it's not that you are you are missing the shall in this. You've got it. It just is saying that that is only one of the many ways that you can do it. Yeah, I hear you. And it's, you know, Alex just added that you have a building also. Um, OK. Yeah. That's what I was, I'm looking for. You know, uh, I realize KP Law did this, um, Bernie, but KP Law started out, my understanding was something else. And then this was also negotiated. So I just, um, you know, this, the, I, I would want to have the lawyer on my side if I was somehow in my wildest dream entering agreement that I pay 15 million and you pay six, but I'm going to pay your six million for you at the beginning and expect you to pay me back the six million later, which is which is what we're we have we have to t take on the debt for the whole construction project. So we're not just taking on the we the town. We're not just taking on the 15 point seven hundred and fifty one thousand. We're taking on, and and we've seen the debt side of that. So we. When we get repaid, we'll be paying off what we hope to have, just short-term short -term debt. So that is the nature of this financial arrangement we're entering into. Um, we're taking on all of the responsibility and then getting paid back, hopefully, fairly soon after. <laughs> so, but, uh, I guess I would just point out that uh, we do have MBLC's requirements that um, are at play in how this was originally structured. Uh, the MOU doesn't flow out of the void, it flows out of um, a construct that is MBLC's construct. Dorothy, your hand was up first, so. Yes, um, I just wanna say that I appreciate the work that Kathy has put into this and it has helped me uh, develop trust. Uh, it has been developed, it wasn't necessarily there in the beginning. And um, I, I think the kind of, of um, lifting every stone, every rock and seeing, is there some place where this is gonna mess up um, is necessary and she knows how to do it. So Kathy, I just want you to know that I really appreciate it. And I, I am satisfied at this point because if there, I think I have enough reasons to trust and it is trust, you're right, it is trust. You can do all the formulas and all the financial planning and then reconciling two different budgets, but it's a question of trust. And I think at this point, that's the best we have, but I think that, that we've really, and you've certainly helped do this, built in a lot of safeguards for the process. So thank you. Alex, you and your hand up and took it down, I assuming that you've decided that you just have nothing more to add at this point. Is there any Further comments about the MOU is I do have one last point that I would make. I want to get others first. And my, my final point is that as I'm looking to just see if other hands go up, that you know, this ultimately in the end gets back to the fundraising plan. And I really appreciate um and have known Ken for quite a number of years in various capacities and have a lot of faith in um, his commitment to see this through and his ability to see this through. I think that uh, what we've learned about the historic tax credits is really um, satisfied. Um, Mo is sort of a, for me, a uh, weak understanding to begin with, but it's become a very strong understanding as we've gone through. So, um, I have uh, a lot of confidence in the, in the library 
ability to do this and just the fact that um, the number of pledges that they have received so far um, in, you know, early in the process before the council has made a decision in and of itself, I think um, speaks very highly to the point. So um, when I put that together with the MOU, um, I'm quite comfortable that um, I have done my part of due diligence on, as a counselor for the town. And uh, that's just my own personal comment. I, so I'm gonna leave it at that. See if anybody else wants to talk further about it. And if not, um, then we're gonna uh, flip over and have a brief presentation of the um, proposed financial orders. And so um, I, Andy, I just wanna have an understanding that I'm going to take these two side notes out. And if Kathy wants to raise them on Monday, she can go ahead and do so. Yeah, um, I think that's reasonable. That's fine with me. Okay, thank you. But I am leaving in this other phrase, Andy, that you added uh, about for the collect special collections area of the library renovation addition to be applied toward. Yeah, and the, of course the trustees have since uh, this got messed up in order and didn't get sent to the trustees before their meeting this morning. Um, they have to ultimately agree to adding that little bit of specificity for the description. Um, Which I just have to say that Alex has already indicated she didn't see it as changing, changing any meaning, so therefore she saw no problem. Well, when we get to the order for the um, uh, CPA, uh, kind of does the same thing. I don't think that it's gonna. So, Andy, I, and yeah. man, I just wanted to point out there was one more change in the document that I think that got looked over quickly. Um, and I don't think it was a change of intent, but I, I don't want it to be overlooked. Um, in the restriction language, in the keeping the library for 30 years. Yeah, uh, which is section what seven or eight, I think. Yeah, um, stop. Uh, do, do, do. The word in trust was taken out. Um, I don't think it was meant that we would actually like put the building in a trust. No, um, no. And, and there was some ambiguity there. So we took that language out. But I just wanted to point it out since we didn't specifically talk about it here. I don't think it makes any difference. Me either, but I just wanted to point it out. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's one that I would have to actually ask uh, the attorney from KP Lost why it was drafted in, to, in the first place to understand it. But I, that was my reaction to I mean, it wasn't a capital T, it wasn't defined. So I, yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop okay. so we can go on. Yes, so um, you have the financial orders too, Lynn, or not? I do. I can just get them to come up properly. Yes. And let me just mention that at the town council meeting, this order will come first, and then the big old order will come second. So this is a uh, fairly standard financial order for Community Preservation Act that involves borrowing. And it has been reviewed. Uh, Sean or 
Paul, am I correct, that it has now been reviewed by um, AP Law? Um, this one has not. Um, Sonia, do you want to speak to this one? This one's been reviewed by Bond Council, but it's pretty um, boilerplate language for borrowing. But can I comment on what Lynn just said that this one would be voted first? This, this was contingent on the larger construction project being voted. So it would make sense for it to be second. You know, uh, I, I would agree with that. And that was our plan. And then when we were speaking to the attorney, the reason it has to go first is because if it goes second, then it's seen as supplanting. Okay. Yeah, no, Sharon uh, was clear about that. Yeah, okay. and, and we can follow up with, um, when we get to the second order, we can talk more about that because we did adjust the second order so that it doesn't include this order. So she might feel differently okay. once she sees both orders. Um, Everybody done with this one? Um, just... Yeah, I just want to point out that um, the Community Preservation, right at the top, the Community Preservation Act has recommended to authorize debt by vote uh, for the special collections facility of the Jones Library. For which, and so the, um, I was just in my prior comment on the MOU, was proposing to tie the MOU back to the order into the grant. So any other questions about this order? If not, I'll have Lynn put up the other order. Seeing no questions, Lynn. That's the right one, okay. So um, this one has also been reviewed by bond council um, and we are awaiting uh, KP's review. So just wanna point that out, we are, it is off to them and um, we'll let the committee know obviously if there are any um, meaningful adjustments. Um, but the key here to notice is that the total amount here is less than 1 million for CPA, um, the 35, 279 up above and, and you get the breakdown here in the chart of how you get to the total project cost. And can I just say, I believe it would be wise to make sure MBLC reviews this. Yeah, so they reviewed the first version, but you're right, I'll get it off to um, okay. Sharon, make sure they take one more look at it. Yeah. Uh, this is Bob, there's a, a typo in the B it ordered. Uh, the line that says it starts with authority and it's about halfway through, therefore is not quite spelled. Oh, oh yep, thank you. Sean, I don't have the... Um, yeah, we'll fix that right before I'm the comma. You, yeah. yeah. And, and, Sean's fault. And I, I had, a, I had a, just a question based on what we, we talked about earlier about how the town is going to borrow essentially the tr library trustee commitment and then get it paid back. This really shows only 15 million in debt, not the total of 20, 21 million. Should that be changed? So up above, you'll see that the, um, the amount authorized is the full amount. Um, and so the town is planning to use bond anticipation notes that will exceed the 15 million to fund um, both potentially the, the fundraising share, but also depending on the timing of when grants come in. Mm -hmm. um, so for both of those reasons, you know, the the borrowing that we will do will exceed the 15 million most likely. Um, and that's why we have the full amount authorized up above. The chart okay. below was mostly just to, to kind of break down the funding sources of where ultimately the debt will come from. Okay, so it's, it's not binding in any way the, right. that anticipated funding sources. Right. Okay. And again, we have this with KP, so we can we'll obviously review it, make sure there's no, no issues with it. 
this one's obviously a little quirkier than sort of the normal borrowing authorization that we would do. So, any questions about this order as proposed now, understanding that uh, we might receive further comments and we'll, uh, from either KP Law or MBLC, and if we do, uh, you'll hear Dorothy. Um, I'm a total layman, but other people who are total lay people will look at this. Is there some way to write it so that it reflects what you said um, that doesn't require you to be in the know to understand it, to interpret it? Because what if different people look at it in the future and they might think it says something different from what you just said, because it's, to me, it's not clear. So if I understand, I don't really, this is not my world, okay. Maybe we can make it clear in the minutes. Um, how you write these things is pretty standard. Yeah, I'll say Sonia's already done a, a pretty good job writing it clearer than sometimes they come through um, when they come straight from the attorney. So, um, but I, I think the point uh, Dorothy is making is about the the funding sources and 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 that piece of it. Um, yeah. Which I think I'm trying to remember if the, the memo speaks to that a little bit because a lot of times with these orders there's a memo that goes with it. So, yeah, um, the thing to remember on here the theme is we're just authorizing borrowing for 35 million in this order, which is in the body of the order. So that's what we're bound to 35 million. The other order is we're, we're authorizing 1 million, which is from CPA. And the reason it's separate is because the debt service is going to be paid from CPA. And you never have to borrow up to the amount you authorize. Um, right. You can always rescind it later. Um, and I think that just happened recently. Yeah, we actually rescinded money from two orders recently. So you're saying there's a memo that will go with this and with the other one? Yeah, I think I'll have to double check where it's, it's at. I thought it might've already been posted um, because we didn't have this order. Oh, it, um, that, that memo is posted, yes. Yeah, I think, so that memo is sort of, would have I want to make sure that memo is consistent with these orders. Yeah, I think it, it should be, but we can double check. Okay. Dorothy, do you want to see anything else here or ask any other questions? Um, no, no, just wanting to, I, I understand that there's special rules and ways of speaking and, and uh, doing things and that you have to do them that way. But since this is an, uh, an area, a topic that a lot of public have been very interested and concerned in. It's just better if when they look at these things, they can understand them. That's all. Kathy, before she takes the order down, do you have questions about the order? Uh, yeah, J Lynn, just could you go back up to the top? Sorry, I'm, I'm only half focusing on as questions. So the CPA, it's an authorization for the thir 35,279,000. And that gets paid down as the grant money flows in um, and as other pieces flow in. And then separately, we're gonna do the million on CPA. Cause the part that I think is confusing later is that, it, that you later see 36 million where CPA is Thanks. a separate part with a separate part of it. Well, the chart was meant to, sorry, can I talk? Please. Go ahead. Chart was meant to clarify that the total project cost is the thirty six million two seventy nine seven. Okay. So I, we just wanted to clarify that yes, there is a grant contribution of thirteen million. Yes, library trustees are committing to five point six million, and yes, the town's local share of debt is going to be fifteen point seven million, and then CPA share of debt is going to be one million for the total of. So it's basically this is the expense. These are the funding sources. Some of it is debt, some of it's gonna be grants and some of it's going to be um, gifts. 
And and Sonia, because and you're saying because it says C O F Y twenty one D six, you know, O six. These two are. It makes it clear these are two separate financial orders within this document. Yes. It's just you know two up separate, above. You're going to yeah. see. Yes. Okay. And just a reminder, we are not going to be borrowing the full thirty six billion. Um, and almost any case that I can imagine, if we are, then something most likely went wrong. Um, right. We're authorizing the full amount because that's what we've been advised to do, but we're only going to be borrowing based on what we need to borrow. And I think the last cash flow model we looked at had us borrowing um, somewhere in like the 20 to 21 range, and, and 5 million of that would be short term um, notes that would be paid back before we uh, go out for a long term borrowing. Now, that was my understanding, Sean, and that and that was under the the grant contribution is being paid fairly quickly once we say go and the construction happens. So that that grant money is flowing in, and it, this the five point six was your short term, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the money that we just talked about with the MOU that the library is going to right find exactly. find all this yep. money, find all this money to pay that line. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need in any way to indicate we are going into long-term debt for 15751 and no. short-term notes when you do an order like this. Nope, because you're authorizing the debt. Um, and then we work with our financial advisor to, to do what we need. Often for almost any borrowing authorization, we do some sort of short-term debt first, and then we'll convert that to long-term debt, and you don't need to do separate votes when that happens. Okay. You know, I just will point out to everyone when we are, when Dorothy talks about to the public at large, when we've shown the numbers on the repair options and others, that should we be doing the repair options, this would uh, have a debt authorization in the 14 or 15 million range if we were financing it all with debt. You know, so we're... Okay. That's the issue with all the MOUs to try to protect us against what is in fact a very, it's a high price project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the financial orders who, uh, and of course the way we've, you would fund uh, repair would be entirely different. Right, but but if we were doing it all in one fell swoop, you know, it's at least what I've looked at, you know, for the fire station and others, we would probably go out for long term debt. So I'm just saying, Andy, it would it would look different. Absolutely, the wording would be different. It just wouldn't have uh, almost more than twice the size of what we expect our actual share to be. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else on the order? Because then I want to try and bring us May to I make a quick question. Yes, this is Pam, um, where it says library trustee commitment. Shouldn't that just say Jones Library Inc. commitment? Thank you, Bob. Yes, yeah. you're right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we could adjust that language. I mean, that this was written before the latest modifications to the MOU, which changed that terminology a little bit. We probably should review the other one, Sean, to make sure. Go back up to the top just real quickly of the order. And then I want to uh, switch to the motion that I would like to see. I would humbly change the word restoration to renovation because restoration, as I understand it in the historic circles has really definite meaning. So it's a small change, but. <laughs> John's got those changes. John, you got that noted. Yep. And you're going to change the Library Board of Trustees to the Jones Inc. in the first paragraph too, right? Yeah, we'll make it consistent with the um, the MOU terminology. Okay. Kathy, your hand is up from before. I assume is not. Yeah. Up sorry. Now. Sorry. I'll 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 un unpull it. Okay. So. Um, I was trying to come up with uh, what I felt was an appropriate way for us to move forward to a conclusion. And uh, I think that um, some kind of motion 
is in order. We've done a lot of work on this. Do you have the motion, Lynn, or do you want me to put it up? I have it. I had sent it to you in Word. Um, we had uh, been assigned by the council to do a financial analysis and a report back. And um, we have done an awful lot of work on it. And um, I uh, appreciate the support of the library in allowing us to do that. We were not asked to make a recommendation as to whether uh, we support the full renovation um, and construction project, uh, the in addition project, and uh, Lynn can speak to that is since as president, I think we got the direction as a finance committee from her. Um, so I thought about what would be the appropriate motion to make. And therefore, the, what I would like to do is offer the following move that the Finance Committee thanks the Jones Library Trustees and Director and the experts who assisted the committee by answering questions from the committee counselors in the Amherst community and provide relevant and providing relevant information. The committee will forward the version of the additional information regarding the proposed library expansion project for consideration by the Amherst Finance Committee, March 2021, revised subsequent to the March 30, 2021 committee meeting to the council. Finance Committee finds that the information provided in this document is the most reasonable projection of the costs and funding plan for the renovation and expansion plan for the repair and uh, repair alternatives and recommends the council rely on this information. I would like to make that motion. So is there a second, Dorothy? Uh, I second the motion. Okay, I'm gonna pause to give people no. a moment longer with it and see if there are any questions or comments. Andy, I want to note yes. that the statement uh, revived subsequent to the March 30, 2021 committee meeting means that in the document you received for today, uh, there will be a substitution of the information that the uh, owner's project manager is sending to me that shows the amounts deducted from various lines. I believe that was the only change. I, I can also, because the historic tax credit thing was not answered in the document by um, Epsilon, but I'd be happy to insert the answers he gave to the committee today into those sections where appropriate, if that's helpful. Okay. So basically, this would be revised based on the March 30th, 2020 committee meeting to the council. Hey, Bob Hegner. Yeah, I would just, my suggestion would be to change the, the phrase, the most reasonable projection to a reasonable projection. Because I don't know that we know what the most reasonable projection is. Well, I'll have to ask the uh, maker of the motion, who's now Lynn, and then the seconder is Dorothy, whether that's an acceptable change. And they're actually in two proposed changes. 
I, as an English teacher, totally agree with Bob Hegner. <laughs> so, uh, is there agreement of the uh, maker of the motion and the seconder to the version that is now on the screen? Yes, sir. Being yes. The, the motion that they are making and presenting to the committee. Because I'd like to then see if there's any additional discussion of the motion. Seeing none, um, I think we can um, proceed to a vote. And um, again, we're um, in a position where uh, all votes of the committee, according to the uh, charter, are by the council members of the committee, but we want to hear from all members of the committee. So, um, Do you want me to, uh, why don't I ask uh, Bob, Bernie, and Jane uh, if they have a recommendation on how the committee votes? So, Bob? Yeah, I, I, I support this statement. Bernie? The, you know, this has been a really uh, a very thorough process, and I do appreciate all the questions and concerns that have been raised. It's uh, having been through this any number of times. Uh, this was particularly enlightening, and uh, I would encourage the uh, committee members to uh, uh, endorse the motion, pass the motion. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I feel like um, all of the questions that I'd had and any concern I had um, about it have been more than addressed, and I think um, that I, you know, I fully support it. Okay, so let me turn to the committee then, and uh, uh, if there are no nobody's raising their hand to make any further comments, just go through and um, ask for votes. And uh, I'll uh, actually um, start with the um, put the maker and the seconder of the motion towards the end. Uh, Pat, um, I support this. Kathy. Yes. I'm a yes. Lynn? Aye. And Dorothy? Yes. So this motion passes on a 5-0 vote. Now, um, we didn't um, <clears throat> obviously include anything specific about the memorandum of understanding and the proposed orders. Um, and uh, the um, question that I would have to put forward to the committee is um, whether we would recommend language or even need to recommend language um, on those or just report to the council that we reviewed them, that um, there was um, some suggestions made which are under consideration and the final version will be coming forward. Kathy? Um, I, I like that way of saying we just reviewed them and I do think that in whatever's written up here, a few sentences that Dorothy was asking for, it's not just in the minutes, but a few sentences that explain what these orders do. Um, why they're phrased this way, you know, and just say we reviewed them and these orders would do the following would be useful. And I did have one other, I just have one other question on, if I can, um, I thought one of the things we were asked to do was review the estimates and decide whether they're reasonable or not. And then at least what I thought we were all supposed to do is the estimate of the total cost, is that likely to be the total cost? In other words, is this a capped? Are we pretty confident that 36.2 building, you know, and are we, we're not, we're not supposed to weigh in, you don't think on that question or not? Yes, that I assume that that was sort of 
explicit to the uh, I do I do think these the are a reasonable projection based on what we can know now. Um, am I totally confident that the cost won't be higher when we uh, try to do this and that the project won't have to change? No. But I do think they can't there's no possibility of them giving us more information right now. So it's it's uh, so so it's just a question, Andy, on I'm comfortable not saying anything more. Um, I just don't know what the larger council thought we would do other than make sure we asked hard questions and got answers. Um, I'll bring the two other people who want to speak to that issue, but it, um, I think that we all understand that uh, the dollar amount would be set and whether adjustments would be need, need to be made to the project has been a matter of substantial discussion within the committee. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, this is, um, this is to my mind, the uh, uh, 36, 279, 700 is a hard stop, it's a ceiling. And uh, I, I think it's it would be wise to emphasize that because there's um, rumor rattling around that this will be some kind of open-ended project that will just keep escalating and escalating and escalating. Um, I mean, that's why there's contingencies in here. This is why it's gonna be bid um, uh, aggressively. This is why there'll be construction uh, estimates, um, two sets of construction estimates done. There's all those safeguards in there to, to, to try to make sure that this is at 36, 279, 700. And um, having um, been forced to write too many legal ads, uh, Dorothy's uh, concerns about readable language are <laughs> right on target. Lynn? Yeah, I have two comments. I First of all, Bernie, thank you. I think you voiced it about as strongly as you can. This is the price. There is no more money. We're not having, we will not entertain the library coming back. They have to build to this price. And the um, second thing is, the only other thing I could suggest is that we, <laughs> and this sounds strange based on what Dorothy has said, and that is for the MOU and the two financial orders is that we would do what GOL does which is basically say it's clear, consistent, and actionable. It doesn't say where we act or how we would act, but that we have decided they're clear, consistent, and actionable. And we can write the report to, to reflect that thought process, but uh... I don't think we need a motion to do it as GOL would do because we're not the GOL process. So is there anything else that people have about what uh, the library project at this point? Because there's only one other issue on the agenda and uh, I'd like to at least turn to it very briefly. Um, and that is uh, the, the budget plan for budget development and um, our committee schedule just so that um, if there's any um, comments people want to offer today's meeting about it and that it frames uh, meetings and process coming ahead. So... Um, Am I supposed to put something up in? Then why don't you go ahead and put that into the... Well, uh, um, is that the thing that Sean sent? Yes. Sean, can you... Put and it? I think that and it was sent to the committee, I believe. Okay, maybe I just didn't... You know. Can we put the calendar up? Uh, oh, I can, if you want. Okay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do it? Okay, sorry. Here we go. So, um, I 
see is the process and uh, the first uh, step is uh, the JCPC and actually um, it's close, but uh, JCPC is having one final meeting to finalize, uh, to just approve the recommendations. So I think they're really finalized. It was just drafting. Kathy can speak to that if she wants. Um, but uh, so that's the first line. Uh, the uh, fact that the school and library budgets are um, due by um, April 1st is a matter of what the charter provides. Um, and then going from there, uh, you see what the process that's being proposed going forward is including what our meeting schedule will be. And our next meeting will be on uh, April 6th to discuss the regional budget, which will have been which would have been presented to the council previously. Um, Lynn, can you scroll down just a little bit so I can see the May schedule when we're meeting with, with which groups? So I had, Andy, I had a request from a counselor who is not on the finance committee, um, whether when the school comes, uh, the elementary schools come, whether we could make it, and it looks like a major part of the meeting and get questions. There are some qu counselors who have questions. Uh, get those, You have you gather some questions in advance to give to the schools in advance? Um, so I see there is elementary school is scheduled to be with community services. So it may be that community services is a relatively short discussion. So just thinking of t time allocation, you and Sean probably have a better sense of that. Um, and the regional budget doesn't come to us at all, right? Because that's been decided separately. The regional school. Regional budget comes. Regional budget in. comes in separately because it has to be on a different timeline. It's a different process, and we will vote a different. Uh, council will vote it on a different date uh, to coincide with town meetings. So, okay, so, so the, so it would have, it's the only topic on April 6th is the regional. Yes. So it's a two stage. Okay. So that part would come early. So it was also the elementary school budget. Yeah. Um, John. Uh, Paul had his hand up first if Paul wants to go first. Yeah, I just, I think we, um, Lynn can correct me, I think we're moving water and sewer rates, it doesn't affect the finance committee from the April 5th to April 12th. Are we doing that, Lynn? Because yes. April 5th is such a loaded meeting. Yep. Although April 12th is starting to feel loaded. Too. <laughs> the finance committee doesn't look at this until May, so we can squeeze it in there somewhere. Lynn, do you want me to make that uh, adjustment to the calendar just so I can get it up? Yeah. Here? Okay. Yeah. So okay. Thinking about it on first, it will be before the council in a, a hearing. I think it is um, on April 8th, April twelfth, and therefore it would come to the council for the second part of the budget, second part of the agenda for the finance committee on April twentieth. The other thing um, that we can do. And we did this in the past, um, and that's um, Athena can poll the counselors to see whether or not any of these finance committee meetings need to be committees of the whole, so that people know they are welcome, other counselors know they are welcome to come and ask questions. Andy, can I just um, say yeah. one thing and follow up to Kathy's comments? So I think for all of the budget review sessions, if people have questions ahead of time and you want to make sure the departments um, address them, I would, yeah, I think we did this last year with like DPW, for example. Um, I 
I encourage you to send them ahead of time and we'll make sure they get to the department so they can um, make sure they're addressed, especially if they're, you know, lengthy questions that you want a really robust response to. Um, and then the other piece is we did talk a little bit about what the, the budget reviews would look like. And, you know, preliminarily we talked about a very brief presentation from the departments with most of the time being reserved for questions um, and trying to not go over things that are already written down in the budget book, but just to, um, you know, give a sort of synopsis, touch on anything that's not there, and then we'll go directly to questions um, to use the time as best as possible. And, and Sean, I just wanted to say that, you know, the one of the people who asked me about when it was coming and getting questions, they're not on finance. So we could, you know, they're, and they might want to come to that meeting, but so Andy, we can just, I know who, who had, just let them know when it is so that they can send those in and they can be compiled, you know, so it's one set of questions that goes rather than they come in in bits and drops. I think this document in its first version was already presented to the council, but I am assuming that we will continue to present it to the council so that they're aware of our meeting schedule for that these very purposes. The other thing I just want to clarify, it was Sean can answer it, is that, um, or Lynn can, that when we have the regional budget hearing that's required by the uh, charter, that the superintendent and uh, Dr. Slaughter will be there. Yeah, they're they're planning to attend. Um, they'll be there on the fifth and the sixth. They'll be at both of those meetings. And so there will be opportunities uh, the council might have to ask questions. I assume. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so there's so. two or three clarifying questions. First of all, Andy, I really leave it to you as chair of finance as to whether or not you want to open up finance committee meetings for committee of the holes for finance committee meetings in May. Um, I, I mean, I welcome comments from anybody on this. Uh, I think we had we did that in some prior years. I don't think we did that last year. Yeah. And uh, but members of the council were informed about all meetings and welcome to be there. And we brought them into the meeting as uh, attendees or, or, or as panelists, rather, if they wish to be there. Just but, they, but they were not, but it was not noticed as a council meeting and we weren't convening it as a council meeting. So we can just have them come in as audience and during public comment. And we can bring them in. Yep, they just can't stay for the whole meeting because otherwise we have to convene it as a full meeting. True. If there's if seven or more of us. Uh, and then my next question really goes back to Kathy. Uh, did the counselor who wants to ask questions want to ask them about the regional school or the elementary school or both? Um, my sense, Lynn, was both, but, um, but I can ask, and I'm sending the, the issues here, you know, just because I, I had paid attention to when these were coming up. Yeah, um, that counselor also called me with the same request um, and had mentioned that he had spoken with Kathy. So that uh, I think that the answer is yes uh, to both. And just wanted to have the opportunity to uh, consider whether questions could be submitted in advance. And I think that Sean has proposed to something that makes sense, which is once the um, town manager's budget is out on April 1st, that all questions should be welcome to be submitted. May 1st. Any, any section. <laughs> May 1st, just to clarify. <laughs> May 1st, May 1st, sorry. I can, uh, I can ensure you April 1st will not have. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the correction. Okay, so I think that we're pretty well done for today. Um, 
I just have, I have a quick question while Paul is with us and Bernie is with us, um, seeing water and sewer rates. We mm -hmm. have a request that came from finance, Paul, to sit down with Guilford, meaning like by Zoom, to talk about some what ifs if we did a fixed quarterly rate. Um, and it's, well, this wouldn't be for next year's water rate, so it's not you know time sensitive. But just if you could figure out if there's some point that works for him to do that. Yes, that's on our radar screen for sure. Okay, yeah, because it's been it's been a while. Not that you guys haven't been busy, but mm -hmm. yeah, we we sent it in a while, and I, I I know that there's been many things on the plate, but I just didn't want it to get lost. Down. It, it, it won't be lost. Don't worry, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I want to be so. It is uh, five minutes of five, and we've been at it for almost three hours now. So I was right. wondering if we could draw it to a conclusion. And I think we've had a. Uh, I just want to thank the entire committee, uh, and uh, Paul and Sean. I think that uh, we've had really had a good process and learned a lot. And I think are in a have created a process that has informed the council and will continue to inform the council about financial aspects of this library proposal and how it fits in with the four building projects. Um, I think it's been great and I appreciate everybody's help and I want to thank you two of you. Yeah, thank you. And Alex so and Sharon are here as well. If there's nothing. The um, yes. let's, let's not forget Sonia because yes, yep. um, I, I think we need a motion to clone her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. <laughs> Lynn, did um, you, Lynn had her hand waving before. I didn't know if Lynn, we can settle it later. I want to know who we're sending questions to so it doesn't become helter skelter. I would, if they're budget related questions, I would say direct them to me and Paul, and we can make sure they get to the right place. Thank you. You can let us know that uh, before the next, before we report it. Okay, so seeing nothing further, thank you everyone. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I think I will, uh, no, no other uh, business, I declare the meeting to be adjourned. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.